With over two decades having passed since its initial release in 1999, Final Fantasy VIII still stands as one of the most iconic and unforgettable games related to the Final Fantasy franchise. This was achieved by building upon what had come before while also introducing new elements. Many of these elements would also go on to become prominent parts of the series as a whole, such as characters with realistic body proportions as well as the now famed vocal track. Let's not forget though that Final Fantasy VIII had big shoes to fill, and Square spent big on development, marketing and distribution to ensure that it would be able to stand toe to toe with Final Fantasy VII. As such, it will become a title rife with fascinating pockets of information and interesting trivia that has remained relatively unknown, save for those who choose to dig a little deeper into the details. And that's just what we'll be doing, as in today's video we'll be diving into even more insightful and very obscure facts relating to Final Fantasy VIII. That's why we won't be talking in too much detail about pretty common areas, like how the song Liberi Fatale was used in the 2004 Summer Olympics for a synchronised swimming performance, or how Laguna's story was originally planned to make up around half of the game's content. So strap yourselves in as we delve into seven more Final Fantasy VIII facts so that we're confident you still didn't know, and we're going to kick things off by talking in detail about how the Gunblade actually works because it's not how you might expect. The Final Fantasy franchise has become known for its unique and original weaponry, and some of the more recent examples include Vanille's binding rods from Final Fantasy XIII and the new lifts from Final Fantasy XIV's Sage Job. But one of the most iconic weapons to have ever appeared across the entire franchise is undoubtedly the Gunblade. After debuting in Final Fantasy VIII, Gunblades would go on to become a staple within the rest of the franchise, with variants featured within the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy XIII and Final Fantasy XIV, but it was Final Fantasy VIII where the most famous and comprehensive versions could be found. Designed by Tetsuya Nomura, the Gunblade was created as an initiative to make the combat experience feel more active. Aside from simply giving wielders like Squall and Cypher commands in battle, it would see players able to hit a button at the right time as a normal attack was executed, and doing so successfully would see them land a second critical hit. The other purpose of the Gunblade was to help distinguish Squall as a character, as this would be an emblematic weapon similar to how the Buster Sword was symbolic for Cloud in Final Fantasy VII. But perhaps the most fascinating and rather obscure element relating to the Gunblade was actually how the weapon worked. When hearing the name Gunblade, the general thought was that it would be a gun and a blade. This would somewhat be the case in Final Fantasy XIII where Gunblades would transform from a sword into an actual firearm, but in truth the original Gunblades in Final Fantasy VIII functioned quite differently. There's a general consensus that the Gunblade actually functions similar to a shotgun, but as was revealed within the Final Fantasy Ultimania archive, instead of acting as a ranged weapon that fires bullets, the Gunblade actually inflicts additional damage via blade resonance. This would still require bullets like a common gun, but instead of firing the projectile to damage the enemy, pulling the trigger would instead transfer the force of the shot to the blade's edge, and if it happened to be in contact with the enemy when the trigger was pulled, the explosion would resonate along the blade, allowing it to deal significantly higher damage than that of a regular sword. This would translate really well into the mechanics of Squall's limit break, Renzakuken, in which pressing the button at the right time would constitute pulling the trigger, thus landing a critical hit. Cypher's Hyperion would also be capable of this, but due to the speed of his attacks, it would require a bit more player skill. Though the performance of the Gunblade would actually change across later installments in Final Fantasy VII Advent Children and XIII, its original form and function from Final Fantasy VIII would ultimately be preserved and even expanded upon in other games. This would happen in the likes of Dissidia as well as in the Shadowbringers expansion where it was an essential part of the Gunbreaker job. Now with any game, encountering the occasional glitch is nothing out of the ordinary. And in this regard, Final Fantasy VIII would be no different, with it featuring numerous bugs. Many glitches would often be harmless, and could even be exploited to the player's advantage like the junction glitch which allowed players to junction the same spell to multiple stats. However, some glitches were far more adverse and could permanently damage the same file leaving players with no choice but to start over completely, and one such bug involved the Ragnarok. 
If the player landed the Ragnarok too close to any structures on the world map, including forested regions, the airship could potentially get stuck on top of that particular area. This would make it impossible for the player to board the Ragnarok again as the airship would be too high up for the character to even enter. This would essentially break the game and prevent the player from completing the main story as the Ragnarok was needed to enter the Lunatic Pandora. If the player had accidentally saved upon triggering this bug unknowingly, it would ultimately require them to have to completely restart and redo three discs worth of content, making it a particularly loathsome glitch. This painful occurrence actually happened to a YouTuber named Zero Kynos when they were attempting a 100% completion run of Final Fantasy VIII. With nine hours invested into the game, the Ragnarok ended up stuck on top of a tree, preventing them from re-entering and effectively ending their run. Thankfully, in the remastered versions of the game, this bug seems to have been patched, but it's something to be mindful of if you happen to be playing the classic versions. In the aftermath of Final Fantasy VII's massive success, the anticipation for Final Fantasy VIII would reach great heights, especially in the West. And while Square would invest much into the game with the hopes of maintaining their growing reputation, they also engaged in some innovative public engagement and outreach activities. One such activity, which was rather ambitious, was the Toyota promotion. This event was exclusive to the US, with Square Electronic Arts partnering with Toyota for a very special pre-sale sweepstake campaign. It allowed individuals who pre-ordered Final Fantasy VIII to register to win one of four Toyota Echoes. At the time, common pre-order bonuses often included items like t-shirts or baseball caps, but Jun Iwasaki, the president of Square Electronic Arts, wanted to go much further than this, with the hopes of garnering greater interest in the highly anticipated Final Fantasy VIII. This was certainly achieved, but even though it was a rather high-profile campaign, what's interesting is that it was never revealed who actually won the competition. In 2019, former Kotaku journalist Tim Rogers made the earnest effort of trying to track down at least one of the winners, but was only able to uncover the sliver of information that someone had possibly just chosen to claim the cash value of the car instead of the car itself, which was around $10,000 at the time. And to this day, it remains a mystery. When Final Fantasy VIII first began its development, Tetsuya Nomura had expressed a desire to place the game in a school setting, which ultimately gave rise to the Garden Military Institutions. The three main facilities were Balam, Galbadia, and Trabia, and outside of Balam serving as the game's starting point, the others became important focuses throughout the story as it evolved. With that being said, the original concept of the gardens was also quite fascinating, at least in comparison to what we got to see within the final product. At one point in development, the three gardens were actually planned to transform into what can only be described as a super garden, with the order being interchangeable. Art director Yosuke Noyora described it as a Getter transformation, most likely taking inspiration from the Japanese mecha series Getter Robot Go, which featured these sort of transformations. This concept would actually extend to the point of having silhouettes prepared for it, but in the end, the idea never came to fruition, as the finished product would only see the individual gardens being able to transform. As a further piece of trivia here, Naora, who was actually in charge of all three gardens, revealed that the term seed, as a name for the students, was actually very symbolic, as there were literally seeds raised within the gardens. Furthermore, Naora also shared that the literal garden concept would extend to their visuals, as each facility building was initially meant to resemble a tree, though they would ultimately be subject to more aesthetic changes later on throughout development. Now, many of the Guardian forces within Final Fantasy VIII would often bring vigour when summoned in battle, boasting a flamboyant signature move and often inflicting substantial damage to foes. But without the high speed mode granted to players in the game's remastered version, the animations of these summons could become rather long-winded and a bit exhausting after a while. In the case of the game's ultimate summon, Eden, this was especially true. But the reward for sitting through the very lengthy summon sequence was that its signature move, Eternal Breath, dealt a huge amount of damage, especially as it was actually possible to maximize the boost. But within the sequence of Eternal Breath was an interesting easter egg and a blatant reuse of assets. At the beginning of the move's execution, if you pay close attention, you can see the exact same footage of the Ptolemy Celestial Diagram from Sephiroth's supernova animation revolving around Eden. 
As the diagram was taken directly from Supernova, it would serve as an interesting point of comparison between Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy VIII, as both Supernova and Eternal Breath are known for their intimidatingly long animations, as well as their massive damage output. And considering both Eden and Sephiroth were large, multi-winged beings with sci-fi elements, this would only add more to their likenesses. This wouldn't be the first time that Square would reuse assets between games either, as many of the character sprites from the original Famicom version of Final Fantasy 1 would essentially be recycled into Final Fantasy 2, albeit with some small tweaks. On a similar theme, with a tremendous amount of effort put into creating video game graphics and environments, developers often leave parts of themselves within the final product. This has sometimes seen snippets left within the source code that were meant as an internal joke, but elements do sometimes make it into the final product that can be visible to players. Hironobu Sakaguchi, for example, made an actual appearance in Final Fantasy VII via a framed picture on the wall in a house in Rocket Town. And a framed picture of Hideo Kojima can also be found within Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes during the Psycho Mantis boss fight. There are also instances where elements have been left in by accident, such as this line of placeholder dialogue. And Final Fantasy VIII would be no different in this regard. As was revealed within the creator interviews that appeared within the Final Fantasy VIII Ultimania, which were translated very kindly by the Livestream.net, several members of the graphics team attempted to discreetly place personal easter eggs in various locations throughout the world. The first of these could be found just before entering the D-District prison. In one of the passages, there will be a handrail with the word CAUTION written on the right-hand side, but inside of the handrail on the left-hand side, instead of reading CAUTION, it would read Takashin in an identical font, which was a nod to the battle effects director Shintaro Takai. But it wasn't done by Takai himself as a vanity claim, this was instead inserted by a CG designer called Aiji Takahashi. It was revealed that Yoshinori Kitase, who directed Final Fantasy VIII, wasn't too happy when he found out that members of the team were doing this kind of thing, and while some elements, such as the one we just mentioned about inserted by Takahashi, managed to sneak their way through, others were not so lucky. For example, lead field designer Kenzo Kanzaki actually drew the face of a woman he knew onto the painting of a woman in the gallery found within Ultima Sia's castle. Once Kitase found out, he demanded that Kanzaki do it properly. Kanzaki did as he was told, but not fully. His new drawing would only be applied to the painting's magnified state, with the minimized state still showing the face of the woman he knew. Another hidden detail would also go unnoticed by the rest of the planners, as lead field designer Yukio Nakatani revealed that he placed his own personal mark inside one of the houses in timber on television. He was tasked with putting images on numerous TV screens, but actually placed a picture of his wife, as well as some baseball imagery, inside one of the screens, as he was a fan of the sport, as well as his wife. Though Nakatani jokingly shared in the interview that Kataze probably wouldn't have been too happy if he found out, these stories would end up being amusing examples of how the developers working on Final Fantasy VIII entertained themselves throughout development. And for our last entry, we arrive at none other than the fascinating backstory surrounding the classic song Eyes On Me, which was, at the time, the franchise's first ever vocal theme. What's interesting, however, is that the insertion of a vocal track was a long-held dream for Uematsu. He had originally wanted to include a vocal track within Final Fantasy VI and then Final Fantasy VII, but couldn't deliver the dream in either of those projects. In the first instance, the plan was scuppered by audio limitations, and in the second, it was scuppered because the development team didn't feel as though there was a natural point where a vocal theme would actually fit within the story. Final Fantasy VIII, however, suffered from neither of those issues, and it resulted in the birth of Eyes on Me. After Final Fantasy VIII was released, Eyes on Me became an instant hit. In Japan, it spent 19 consecutive weeks at number one in the Western music charts, selling over 500,000 copies in the process. And Eyes On Me would even go on to win Song of the Year for Western Music at the 14th Annual Japanese Gold Disc Awards, where it would have the honour of being the first song from a video game to ever win an award. But perhaps one of the most interesting facts is that Square considered many other singers before ultimately deciding on Fei Wong. In an attempt to scout out the best singers to perform the song, the development team gathered numerous CDs released by high-profile singers from all around the world. Amongst these were the likes of Celine Dion and Mariah Carey, both of whom were incredibly decorated at the time and would have no doubt cost a pretty penny to hire. 
With Final Fantasy going from strength to strength in the West, however, Square must have been considering how much the association with these artists would have further enhanced Final Fantasy's credibility within the Western markets. But inevitably, things weren't panning out as intended, and during their struggles to find the right singer, scenario writer Kazushige Nojima, having been a big fan of her music for a while, suggested Fei Wong, adding her CD to the big pile of potential artists. Upon listening to Wong's music, the rest of the team were suitably impressed, and it's alleged that after coming to an agreement, she was paid approximately $1 million for the gig. The massive success of Eyes On Me would go on to pave the way for more high-profile vocal collaborations in the future, with every mainline Final Fantasy game featuring some kind of vocal theme. Some of these have been aligned with Japanese artists such as Kodakumi and Angela Aki, but it was also stretched much further, with Square Enix licensing a track from Leona Lewis for use in Final Fantasy XIII's Western release, and collaborating with Florence and the Machine for a rendition of Stand By Me in Final Fantasy XV. And with that, I think we're done. There were seven more facts about Final Fantasy VIII that you probably didn't know, but I'm still sure there were some amongst you who knew them all. Let us know in the comments below which fact you found to be the most interesting, and if you enjoyed the video, please give us a like and be sure to subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd love to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube members and supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory and Zedorn, who are super special Onionite supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.